Welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and in this video series, we have been talking all about the Melchizedekian Pesach. And the Melchizedekian Pesach is the Passover that we keep when we're under Yeshua's renewed Melchizedekian order. And what we've seen so far in this video series is that some parts of the Pesach rituals can change depending upon which priesthood has the active anointing. Other parts of the Pesach rituals can change depending upon whether we're inside the land of Israel or outside the land of Israel. However, there are also certain ordinances, statutes, and judgments of the Pesach, and those never change, no matter which priesthood has the active anointing. So the question then becomes, how should we keep the Pesach today under Yeshua's renewed Melchizedekian order? So please join us for this final chapter in our series. We talk about what we should do today to keep the Pesach under Yeshua's renewed Melchizedekian order. Please join us. We've covered a lot of ground in this presentation, so what we'd like to do is we'd like to talk first about the ordinances of the Pesach that never change, no matter which priesthood has the active anointing. Then we're going to review the reasons why some of the specifics of the rituals can change from one priesthood to the next. And then finally, armed with this detailed information, we're going to be able to see which of the specifics apply to Yeshua's Melchizedekian Pesach and which do not. Now, we learn a lot from the original ritual in Exodus chapter 12. Now, to catch up to the storyline, in Exodus chapter 12, Israel's getting ready to leave Egypt in order to become its own independent sovereign nation. And they'll be equipped complete with their own internal priesthood. And they're going to go to the land of Israel as the organized nation. Yahweh calls them the armies of the living Elohim. It's very important that we understand that we're being called out as an organized nation. Uh, it's covered in Parashah Nitzavim, for those of you that read the Torah Parashah. So Israel's not called as a mass of motley individuals, but called as an organized nation. So it's very important that we understand that. Okay, so in Shemot or Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 8, Yahweh says that some of the things that are never going to change is that we shall eat the flesh on that night. We're talking about the conjunction of the 14th and 15th. And it'll be roasted in fire. And we're going to eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And we're not to eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but only roasted in fire. In verse 14, Yahweh tells us to be careful that this day is to be to us as a memorial. And we're going to keep it as a feast to Yahweh, throughout our generations. That means anytime there's a generation of Israel, we're supposed to keep this feast. And he says we shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. That's pretty clear language. That means we always want to keep the Pesach. Now the only question is, how should we keep the Pesach? Okay, so some of the things that never change. Yahweh continues in verse 15. And he tells us that seven days we're going to eat unleavened bread. On the first day of the feast, we're going to make sure there's no leaven in our houses. For anyone who eats leavened bread, symbolic of sin, symbolic of false doctrine. From the first day until the seventh day, that person's going to be cut off from Israel. And for me, this is some very important language because we know that sin is, the leaven is symbolic of sin and also symbolic of false doctrine. So what this means is that anyone who partakes of sin and anyone who partakes of false doctrine, he is going to cut off from the nation of Israel. That's pretty serious. That's pretty severe. We need to pay attention to that. We need to have fear of the living Elohim. So let's continue. Now, in the first chapter, we talked about how the Apostle Shaul, or Paul, told us in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, we need to be extremely careful not to let any man but the body of Messiah tell us what to do with regard to the ritual meal offerings, such as the Pesach, the ritual drink offerings, such as the renewed covenant in Yeshua's blood, the cup 
or in respect of a feast day or of a new moon day or of the Sabbath days because these are all prophetic shadow pictures of things that are still to come. And if you want to talk about some craziness, how many messianics are there who listen to the rabbis and who listen to the Karaites, people who are not the body of Yeshua, tell us not only when to keep the Pesach, but also how to keep the Pesach. That's specifically what the Apostle Shaul was writing against here, because we're told to beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because Yahweh is going to cut off from Israel anyone who partakes of false doctrine. So be careful. Some people believe it's okay. You can drink from all fountains. A lot of people believe it's okay to listen to this teacher and that teacher and this group and that group and this sect and that sect and some other sect. And you end up with some people who end up doing very much the wrong things. It's important that we not do that. Okay, continuing on in verse 17. Yahweh says, So we are to observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For in this same day he will have brought our armies, our organized nation, our armies, out of the land of Egypt. He says, Therefore we are to observe this day throughout our generations as an everlasting ordinance. So once again, we're always going to keep the Pesach. It's just the way we keep the Pesach is going to change depending upon which priesthood has the active anointing and whether we're inside the land of Israel or outside the land of Israel in the dispersion. So, you know, the ordinance of the Pesach never change. So the ordinances, these right now, we're talking about the specifics that are never going to change no matter who the priesthood is and no matter whether we're inside the land or outside the land. Verse 18, he says, In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, we are to eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. And this is something that is never going to change no matter which priesthood and no matter where we are. He says, for seven days, no leaven. And we're talking about no sin. He's talking about no false doctrine. That's the fulfillment of the shadow picture. No leaven is to be found in our houses anywhere. Since whoever eats what is leavened, referring to sin or false doctrine, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's a stranger or a native of the land. So what we're really saying here is, we have to be conformed to Yeshua's example. We have to be conformed to Yeshua's image and likeness, or effectively, he doesn't like it. He rejects us. We, we must be conformed to Yeshua's walk, or we're going to be cut off from the nation of Israel. So, he says, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings, you shall eat only unleavened bread. So, again, we saw that the Last Supper was on the evening or the conjunction of the 13th and the 14th. So that's different than the Pesach or the Passover meal, which happens on the conjunction of the 14th and the 15th. So what happens is the Pesach is sacrificed on the afternoon of the 14th. We actually eat the Passover meal on the start of the 15th, and then we are to eat unleavened bread for seven days until the evening beginning the 22nd day of the first month. So those are the things that never change. Now let's talk about some of the specifics that do change, that are specific to the various rituals, let's say, of the no priesthood Pesach. So in Exodus chapter 12, with the no priesthood Pesach, there was no internal Israelite priesthood because they were down in Egypt under the kingship of Paro and under the priesthood of the Egyptian priests. Not a clean priesthood. So the purpose was to help Israel leave Egypt and become an organized nation and go to the land of Israel. In Exodus chapter 11 and verse 1, we learn that the Exodus would be a, a rapid event. Israel was to prepare for a rapid flight from Egypt. And then in Exodus chapter 12, in verse 3, Yahweh said to speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of the month, every man was to take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father a lamb for a household so this is because there was no priesthood in egypt at that time so for that reason the men of the houses or the patriarchs you might say of the houses 
were going to be responsible for offering the offerings for their own house and also putting the blood on the doorposts, symbolic of Yeshua's blood. Verse 5, Yahweh says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, symbolic of Yeshua, a male of the first year. He says, You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and that's what was called the flock. He says, Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. The 14th day, that's an ordinance. That's never going to change. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it between the evenings. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Now that's the shadow picture. And today, of course, we apply Yeshua's blood to our hearts. Verse 8. He says, Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. That part's an ordinance. He says again, Do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roasted in fire, its head with its legs and entrails. Okay, now, the bit about roasted in fire, that's an ordinance. And he says, And you shall let none of it remain until morning, but what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. That's specific to Exodus chapter 12, the first Pesach. And he says, And this is how you shall eat it, with a belt on your waist and shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Pesach. And this concept of feasting in haste while standing, that's specific to the Exodus 12 situation because it was a rehearsal for fleeing Egypt. So now let's take a look at the specifics of the Levitical Pesach. And these are things that were specific to the Levitical order. Okay, so now in Shemot or Exodus chapter 12 and verse 25, Yahweh says, And it will come to pass, when you come to the land which Yahweh will give you, just as he promised, that you shall continue to keep this service. So once again, the fact that we keep the Pesach, that will never change. It's only the way we keep the Pesach is going to change because now, instead of not having a priesthood, now Israel is going to have a Levitical order. So that's very important. Then in Deuteronomy, or Devarim, chapter 12, and verse 1, Yahweh says, These are the statutes and judgments which you shall be careful to observe in the land which Yahweh, your Elohim, of your fathers, is giving you to possess all the days that you live on the earth, or all the days that you live on the soil. And again, these are things that are specific to when we're living in the land of Israel, which is typically where you find a cleansed Levitical priesthood. And the reason why you find a cleansed Levitical priesthood in the land of Israel is that when Israel was traveling together out in the wilderness, they didn't need to unite three times a year around the altar because they were already together. But once Israel had gone into the land of Israel and then they had spread out, it was necessary to unify the nation three times a year around a sacrificial altar. Okay, so the same monologue continues four chapters later in Deuteronomy chapter 16, starting in verse 1. And this is something very important. This part is an ordinance. Yahweh says to observe the month of the Aviv. Now, for those of you who are on the Jewish side of the house or you're speaking Hebrew, I'd like you to check this out. He doesn't say observe the month of Aviv, which is, just takes place in the spring on the Jewish calendar, the Hillel 2 calendar, but he says to observe the month of the Aviv. And it's very important that we observe the month of the Aviv the right way because we saw before Yahweh wants us to keep the Pesach in its time. And if we're listening to the Karaites or certain Messianic groups, we're going to end up keeping the Pesach in the wrong month because the Karaites and certain Messianic groups, they typically keep their feast about a month after it's actually supposed to be observed. And we'll talk about that. We talk about the days of unleavened bread. So he says, Observe the month of the Aviv and keep the Pesach to Yahweh your Elohim. For in the month of the Aviv, Yahweh your Elohim brought you out of Egypt by night. And he says, Therefore you shall sacrifice the Pesach to Yahweh your Elohim from the flock and from the herd. Okay, the flock refers to sheep and goats. The herd refers to cattle. So if you're living in the land of Israel, your Pesach can be of beef. Okay, if you're 
outside the land of Israel, it can only be from the sheep or from the goats. And if we're inside the land of Israel, then we should keep the Pesach in the place where Yahweh chooses to place his name, which we saw before is Jerusalem. Now, one of the things we saw, and we'll talk about this at the end of this video, sometimes the transition from one priesthood to the next takes time. It happens over a number of years, and there's a lot more we could say about that if we had time. So, but for example, in the first month of the second year after Israel left Egypt, Yahweh said to hold the Pesach service the same way in the wilderness, ironically, even though Israel now had a Levitical priesthood and no doorposts. So that's a subject for further discussion, some other place and time. Uh, not really possible to keep the Pesach exactly the same way, but as close as they could. In Bamidbar, or Numbers, chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it says, Now Yahweh spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they'd come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Let the children of Israel keep the Pesach at its appointed time. Dropping down to verse 10, Yahweh says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If any one of you or your posterity, meaning in the future, is unclean because of a corpse, or if he's far away on a journey, he may still keep Yahweh's Pesach on the 14th day of the second month at twilight, or at the going down of the sun, between the evenings, they may keep it. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So basically the change is to keep the Pesach a month later. But again, when we're in the land of Israel, there's going to be certain statutes and judgments that are going to apply to us as long as we're in the land of Israel. So again, in Deuteronomy or Devarim, chapter 16 and verse 1, Yahweh tells us to observe the month of the Aviv and keep the Pesach to Yahweh our Elohim for in the month of the Aviv, Yahweh our Elohim brought us out of Egypt by night. And if you have access to the Hebrew and you read Hebrew, I'd encourage you to look this up. It says the month of the Aviv. So what is the month of the Aviv? Well, we'll talk more about this when we talk about the wave sheaf offering. But the month of the Aviv is when it's the month in which the very first sheaf of Aviv barley first fruits can be offered to Yahweh 15 to 21 days after that new moon day. Rosh Hadesh on the day of the wave sheaf offering, which is called Yam Hanafat HaOmer. Okay, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to bring him the very first sheaf of Aviv barley first fruits. The Karaites and certain Messianic groups, they don't do that because they base their calendar not on the first sheaf of first fruits, they base their calendar upon the main harvest, which typically comes about a month later. And in fact, in the Karaite and the Messianic calendars, typically speaking, the very first sheaf of Aviv barley first fruits has already completely shattered and has fallen on the ground. Which, when you consider the symbolism, that this first sheaf of Aviv barley first fruits is symbolic of Yeshua, the Karaites and even the Messianics are waiting until it's shattered and on the ground. If you think about the symbolism of that, that's very unclean. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about the day of the wave sheaf offering. And continuing in verse 2, he says, Therefore you shall sacrifice the Pesach to Yahweh your Elohim from the flock and from the herd. So once again, we're able to have the Pesach from cattle or from beef when we're living in the land of Israel. He says, and it's very, very specific, he says that we are to hold the Pesach ritual in the place where Yahweh chooses to put his name. And he emphasizes that several times. For example, verse 5, he continues, You may not sacrifice the Pesach within any of your gates which Yahweh your Elohim gives you, like was done in Exodus chapter 12. Because in Exodus chapter 12, Israel didn't have a priesthood. They'd been under the Egyptian priesthood. So the men of the houses, or you could say the patriarchs of each house, sacrificed the Pesach within their gates and then placed the blood upon their own doorposts. 
But the reason Yahweh doesn't want that in the land of Israel, as we said before, is Israel's spread out when they're in the land of Israel. It's necessary to unify the nation around a sacrificial altar three times a year in order to maintain a sense of cohesiveness and a sense of being a nation together by unifying the nation around a sacrificial Levitical altar. And he continues in verse 6, but at the place where Yahweh or Elohim chooses to make his name abide, which that place today is Jerusalem. He says, there, that's where you shall sacrifice the Pesach between the evenings at the going down of the sun at the time you came out of Egypt. In verse 7, he says it again. He says, and you shall roast and eat it in the place which Yahweh or Elohim chooses. And in the morning, you shall turn and go to your tents. So there we have a large number of witnesses that when we live in the land of Israel, Yahweh wants us to come to the place where his sacrificial altar is placed so that the nation will then stay together. Now we know that this is Jerusalem. We'll see a reference to this again to the end of this video. We know that this is in Jerusalem because in Zechariah chapter 1 and verse 17, Yahweh says he will again choose Jerusalem. He says it again in Zechariah 2 and verse 12. And we believe this took place in 1948 when the nation of Israel was born in one day. So now let's see what are the things specific to the Last Supper. So now let's remember, in Yeshua's time, which was in the first century in what's called the Second Temple Period, Israel was already living in the land of Israel. They didn't need to rehearse fleeing and going to the land of Israel in haste. So by the Second Temple period, our Jewish brothers and sisters had already developed a tradition of eating the Pesach sitting down. They would have a low slung table, typically 12 to 18 inches off the ground. Then you'd put down blankets and pillows and these kinds of things, and they would lean or recline or sit. But generally speaking, they would make themselves comfortable. Now, Again, I'll try to say this in as much love as I can. You talk to the rabbis and even the messianic rabbis that I know, but you talk with them about, you know, why is the Pesach ritual look this way for the Pesach Seder? And what they say is that in the ancient Middle East, slaves typically stood to wait on their masters as they ate. And the rabbinic thinking goes that since the Jews are no longer slaves, therefore they should lean or recline at the Pesach table to celebrate Israel's freedom from bondage. And again, the problem with that is that has no relation and no bearing whatsoever on Scripture. That is not the reason why Israel stood in Exodus chapter 12. Uh, and this is just typical of the things that the rabbis do. They give you a bunch of reasons that sound good, but they just really don't hold up to scrutiny. They don't really hold water, so to speak, because they're basically making things up. But what we see is that the Passover Seder is a very scripted, they literally have a script. Uh, it's a very stylistic meal, and it involves taking four cups of wine, it involves eating from various bowls of dip or sop, uh, the modern satyrs, they point to a shank bone. Sometimes they have an egg on the plate, things that have no relation or bearing to Exodus chapter 12 in any way, shape, or form. But they also emphasize sitting, or perhaps in ancient times laying down, or being in generally in a reclining or laying position. Now it does seem that the Last Supper tends to follow what later became the Pesach Seder ritual. For example, in Matthew, Yahu, or Matthew chapter 26 and verse 20, it tells us that when evening had come, Yeshua sat down with the twelve. And then three verses later, Yeshua said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me, speaking about the bowls of dip or sop. Now what this is, is this is what's called the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony. And we'll talk about this a lot more when we get time to talk about the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony. But in the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony, you had three phases of the wedding. And the first phase was what's called Shiduchim. So when you had the parents of the groom and bride had made the match, and the groom and the bride themselves had consented to the match, then the wedding was confirmed by holding a celebratory meal together. And that effectively ratified the marriage, and then they would hold the public ceremony later. And so what we'll see, or what we've seen in our studies so far, and what we'll see again when we go to put it on video, 
is that the match is then later publicly announced at Shavuot or Pentecost, or at least that's the symbolism of Shavuot or Pentecost, is it's the phase of what's called Erusin, and we'll talk more about that in some other place. But what we need to see here is that the Last Supper was not the Pesach, because the Last Supper was held the night before the Pesach on the conjunction of the 13th and 14th. Therefore, it doesn't have anything to say about the rites or rituals of the Pesach on the conjunction of the 14th or the 15th. But rather, what the Last Supper was, was a wedding covenantal meal confirming the match, confirming Shiduch. And that's why Yeshua says in Matthew or Matthew 26, starting in verse 26, he says, And as they were eating, Yeshua took bread. Okay, so once again, we're going to eat his flesh and drink his blood. Now, when we eat something, it becomes incorporated in our body. This is how we become one flesh. We eat his flesh, it's incorporated in us. Same thing with the drink, with the cup. He says, Yeshua blessed and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, because you're going to become one flesh with me. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the renewed covenant, or the renewed wedding covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And so what's happening is Yeshua is giving us the cup to partake of his blood. And you might perhaps imagine that when we drink his blood, it's then applied to the lintel and the doorposts of our hearts. That's the symbolism. But the whole thing is a renewal of the Shiduchin marriage vow. And it would then become public later at Shavuot or Pentecost. We'll talk more about that. So what we see in all this is just the extent of Elohim's great love for us. Because Yeshua came to redeem his bride, Ephraim, in the same way Hoshea or Hosea went to redeem his sinful wayward bride, Gomer. So Gomer had sold herself into sexual slavery. And Hoshea went to go literally to pay for her and to buy her back. So in much the same way, Yeshua came to pay for Ephraim's sins and also those of Judah who sojourned with Ephraim with his blood. That's love. But it's important to understand, people do all sorts of strange, crazy things with the Last Supper. Just think about it. Yeshua never said, Let's take the Eucharist wafer and a cup of ritual communion wine. And let's make an annual foot washing ritual on, a, on a, a night to be much observed. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, remember our wedding vows. That's what he was saying. And that's what's so crazy. When people let the rabbis and the Karaites tell them not only when is the Pesach, but how to observe the Pesach. I mean, can you imagine... If you're in business, do you talk to your competition and ask them for advice on how to run your business? You know, if you're going out to battle, if you're going out to war, I mean, they're our brothers, but they're in opposition to us. They've been given an opposing role. If you're going to go to battle, do you take counsel with your enemy to ask them how you should run your business, how you should run things? It's crazy what some of the Messianics, who they listen to. I, I don't understand it. I mean, it just, to me, it just baffles it, it boggles my mind. I, I can't understand why they would do such a thing. It, to me, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But so now what we want to do is now we want to take all this detail that we've been given and we're going to see about the specific elements of the Melchizedekian Pesach. And we're going to see what applies to us today and what doesn't. Okay. Now, the first thing, the very first thing that we need to do is we need to understand our purpose. Okay, Yeshua came for a Proverbs 31 bride. He was going to help him build his kingdom. And that's what the Great Commission is all about. So in Matthew or Matthew Yahu, chapter 28, starting in verse 18, Yeshua came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples in all the nations, immersing them in my name. And if you'd like to know why we immerse in Yeshua's name only, I'd encourage you to go to Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 3, 
And there's a study called Immersion in Yeshua's Name Only, and there you can see why we don't use the Trinitarian formula, but we only immerse in Yeshua's name. But Yeshua says, and teach them, teach these disciples to observe or to keep. The word in Hebrew would be shomer, to guard or to obey. All things that I have commanded you, all things. That's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone who does everything Yeshua says to do. Someone who eagerly wants to be conformed to Yeshua's image and likeness and example. He says, and behold, I'm with you always even unto the end of the age. Amen. So the thing is, that's our purpose. And we're supposed to go into all nations to immerse disciples in His name. Well, the land of Israel is one of those nations. It's not a cleansed nation right now. It's presently a Babylonian democratic nation. The scriptures never advocate democracy. We'll talk about that in some other place. We talk about it in Acts 15 order. We talk about it in Torah government. But the scripture never advocates democracy. So, but Yeshua says in Matthew Yahu or Matthew 24, starting in verse 15, he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the set apart place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Key word, flee. So the thing we need to realize about this is our job is not to be in the land of Israel right now. I remember when I first came to the Messianic movement and got the call to serve, I spent a lot of time and a lot of effort looking for ways that we could go back to the land of Israel. There's a lot of Ephraimites, a lot of two-house people. They're very concerned with going back to the land of Israel early. Okay, We're not supposed to do that. Yeshua never said to do that. What Yeshua says to do is to go into all nations and immerse disciples in His name who are going to do literally everything He said to do. And the reason we're doing that is we are entering now into the end times. And we are going to see the governments of the world fall when the Babylonian system falls at the seventh trumpet. We talk all about this in Revelation of the End Times. You can also watch it on video, Revelation Simplified, on the Nazarene Israel YouTube channel. But when the governments of the world fall, when the Babylonian system falls and goes down hard, never to rise again, there's going to have to be a replacement system of world spiritual government. Something that's beneficial for the people of the world. That's what Yeshua is calling us to. That's the high calling that He wants from us. So this is what we need to do. And the only way we can do that is literally to do everything that He's calling us to do. That's why He's asking us to dis- immerse disciples in all nations and to teach them to do everything that he says to do because he's going to give us his rod of iron to rule and reign over the nations during the millennium with him as our head in the heavens being communicated with by his spirit but we are going to be his body with his rod of iron we are going to be his hands and his feet dashing the nations to pieces the only way you can do that with integrity is to submit completely to the spirit and to listen for the Spirit 24-7 at all times. There should never be a time when we're not listening for His Spirit tell us what to do and how to do it because that's the calling. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So, uh, in the land of Israel, uh, they do. the land of Israel is one of those nations we're supposed to go into and make disciples, and the ministry is first to the Jew, and then also to the returning Gentile Ephraimites. But one of the things is that we really need to remember that our mission is not to be in the land of Israel right now. And if anyone tells you it is, they don't know what they're talking about. Now, if you happen to be Jewish and you're born in the land of Israel or you feel the call to go to the land of Israel, that's fine, that's good. You need to obey whatever Yahweh's Spirit is telling you to do. But bear in mind, That's not our mission, is to relocate to the land of Israel right now. 
Okay, that's forcing the door open. That's not what we're supposed to do. Okay, if we live in the land, we're going to need to flee the land of Israel when the abomination of desolation is set up. And that's going to be during the second half of the tribulation. We talk about that in Revelation in the end times and also in our video series, Revelation Simplified, on the Nazarene Israel YouTube channel. So if we think about this, then Yeshua says, when you, rec when you see the abomination that makes desolate being set up on the set-apart place, get out, go, leave the land. So to me, rather than leave in a time of duress, to me the thing that makes sense is don't go to the land of Israel now. Don't play that game. That's a bad, bad game. There's a lot of two-house people, a lot of Ephraimites playing that game of trying to find a way back to the land. Mm -mm, don't do it. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. Our job right now is to be establishing the global network, the global spiritual kingdom, by immersing disciples in all nations. That's what we're supposed to do. Okay, that's our primary job. So if you're called to the land of Israel, you're called to be there, you're called to, to witness to your other Jewish brothers and sisters, go and may Yahweh be with you. May Yahweh give you his words to speak and may he give you all favor. But don't let that be your focus. Just let that be one of the many lands that we're called to go witness and immerse disciples in. Okay. So at some point, if you do go there, or if you are there now, at some point you're going to have to flee. And then you're going to meet up with the rest of Ephraim, those of returning Ephraim, and we are out in the nations. That's who is being immersed in all the other nations. And we also are going to have to leave, but not fleeing. So to put this in context, those who are living in the land of Israel are going to have to flee at the midway point of the tribulation. And then after the tribulation and after Armageddon, then there's going to come what's called the engathering. It's also called the second exodus. And Yahweh speaks to this time in Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 12. And this is when redeemed Ephraim is going to come back from all the nations along with those of Judah who are sojourning with Ephraim. And speaking of that time, Yahweh says, you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For Yahweh will go before you, and the Elohim of Israel will be your rear guard. So we will have to leave Egypt, so to speak, but we will not flee Egypt. We will not go out in haste. So that's the difference. If you're in the land of Israel right now, yes, you will have to flee in haste when the abomination that makes desolate is set up. But then once you've left, and we come back to the land of Israel, yes, we will leave Egypt. We will leave the world system, so to speak, but not in haste. And we will not go by flight because Yahweh's got us covered. So just to hit this with more detail, again, we need to remember always, what are we rehearsing? If you're in the land, you're rehearsing fleeing the land of Israel when the abomination that makes desolate is set up on the set-apart place. So if you're living in the land of Israel, you should rehearse fleeing for the Pesach. Also, we're also confirming the Shidduch. We're confirming the Shidduchim phase of the marriage. We're effectively renewing our marriage vows. Okay, So they're going to flee the land of Israel. And then for the rest of us who are outside, they're going to join those of us who are presently outside the land. And we're all going to rehearse going home to the land of Israel in the second exodus or in the ingathering. And we're going to rehearse leaving but not fleeing. Important distinction. We'll talk about this later. Again, we're also confirming Shiduchim. We're confirming our marriage vows in Luca or Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. Yeshua took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we're remembering our marriage vows. We're confirming or renewing our marriage vows. We're confirming the Shidduchim phase. Okay, so now we're going to talk about this, and we're going to see how all these things are related. We've got some charts we're going to take a look at. We're going to ask three clarifying questions in these charts. I guess that's three. Okay, 
First, we're going to ask, what priesthood are we under? Second, we're going to ask, are we inside the land of Israel or are we outside the land of Israel? And the third, we need to always be conscious, what are we rehearsing? What are we trying to do here? Okay, how, we know we're trying to build Yeshua's kingdom. That's our primary overall purpose. But how are we trying to build Yeshua's kingdom? What phase of the operation are we in right now? Okay, now let's take a look at this chart. Now, down the left-hand side, you, it's going to see which priesthood do we have. Now, first, we have the no priesthood priesthood of Exodus chapter 12, or what might be called the patriarchal priesthood. Then we have the Levitical priesthood. Then we take a look at the time point, a snapshot of the Last Supper, which is under the Levitical priesthood. Then we're taking a look at Yeshua's renewed Melchizedekian order, which has the active anointing today. And then in each one of those four categories, we're going to take a look at what is the purpose of the Pesach. What are we trying to do here? What are, what are we rehearsing? What, what are we getting at here? What's the point? Okay, so under the no priesthood priesthood, or the patriarchal priesthood, the purpose of the original Pesach was the Shidduch. In the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony, we'll talk about this more in some other place, the purpose was to make the match. There was an agreement between Yahweh and Israel, and this is the private covenantal meal. Now, again, that will be made public at the time of Shavuot or Pentecost. We'll talk more about that when we give the presentation on Shavuot or Pentecost. But plus, there was a secondary purpose. It was also to prepare Israel for fleeing Egypt as an organized nation. Again, take a look at Parashah Nitzavim. Israel was called into Yahweh's service as an organized nation. Okay, so now then we come to the Levitical priesthood. And what's the purpose of the Pesach under the Levitical priesthood? It's to remember our wedding vows. It's to renew the vow of the Shidduch that was originally taken in Exodus chapter 12. Same thing with the Last Supper, except it was also to establish a renewed covenant. In other words, to renew the wedding vows through the body and blood of Yeshua Messiah. And that's also the purpose today, is to remember these renewed wedding vows, to remember the renewed wedding covenant. That's the purpose of the Pesach today. Now, granted, <laughs> wedding in, in Yahweh's uh, sight looks a lot different than it looks on earth, as we talk about in the study on Revelation in the end times. Armageddon is the wedding feast. So it's a wedding feast with combat boots. Okay, that's a different matter. Now, let's take a look. Is there a standing priesthood? Well, in the no priesthood priesthood, uh, no, there, there was no priesthood. So there was no standing priesthood. So they did stand during the ritual of Exodus chapter 12, but there wasn't a standing priesthood like you could say under Levitical order. In Levitical order, obviously, yes, there's a standing priesthood. And in the Last Supper, yes, there's still that Levitical order, or you might say it had corrupted itself into what we call today the Rabbinical order, but at least there was a standing priesthood. Now, but something else also happened. Earlier in this series, we talked about transitions and how sometimes the transition from one priesthood to another can take time. So we begin to see the transition to the Melchizedekian order. So Yeshua is renewing the wedding vows with his Proverbs 31 bride. And then later we see in the book of Acts, we begin to see how Yeshua's priesthood was being established. And so is there a standing priesthood today? Yes, exactly. That's what Nazarene Israel is. Now, there has been a great falling away, and right now there's presently being a restoration from that great falling away, but we see the evidences of the original priesthood in the book of Acts. And then there's a falling away into Christianity and then into Catholicism and then a restoration. We talk about this in the Nazarene Israel study, a, a partial restoration in Protestantism, a little bit further restoration in the messianic movement and now we are beginning to see the full-on restoration with the restoration of the original first century sect of the nazarenes so then we should ask is there a need to rehearse fleeing in haste well in the exodus 12 pesach yes there was clearly a need to rehearse or to prepare to flee in haste 
Whereas in the Levitical priesthood, no, they were already dwelling in the land of Israel. So they were rehearsing effectively dwelling in the land. Uh, again, at the time point of the Last Supper, they were also ev effectively rehearsing dwelling in the land. Now they would eventually leave Israel to go into all nations to make disciples in all nations and immerse them in Yeshua's name, but they would not do so in haste. So now we just saw in the Melchizedekian order, if you're living in the land of Israel, yes, there is a need to rehearse fleeing the land of Israel in haste because the abomination that makes desolate is going to be set up. But if you're in the dispersion, yes, there's a need to leave Egypt. There's a need to leave the world system, but not in haste. So under both circumstances, we're leaving but in the land, it's with haste. In the dispersion, it's not with haste. Okay, what about blood on the doorposts? Obviously, in the Exodus 12 service, yes, they physically placed the blood on the doorposts because that was a prophetic shadow picture of Yeshua. But then in the Levitical order, no, they didn't place the blood on the doorposts because, for one, you would leave your house and come up to Jerusalem and then you would offer your sacrifices at the altar because one of the purposes was to unify the nation. But typically speaking, it's way too far to take the blood back to your house and apply it to the doorpost. Doesn't work like that. And then in the days of the Last Supper, you had the same thing going on at the temple. The physical lamb, the physical sacrifice was going to be offered at the altar, but we would effectively place Yeshua's blood on the doorposts of our hearts. And that's the same as today in the Melchizedekian order. Once again, we're placing and confirming Yeshua's blood on the doorposts of our hearts, so to speak. Now we get some frequently asked questions, and I believe they're very good questions. And I, it, a lot of people dismiss them, but I think there's a lot to this. Some people say, wait, 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 hold up, Norman, hold up. Okay, so now if we're not living in the land of Israel, Okay, why don't we automatically revert back to the Exodus chapter 12 service? And I believe that's a very good question. But the answer to that is, we're not under a no priesthood situation. This is not a no priesthood Pesach, because we now have a standing Melchizedekian order. And while the order of Melchizedek can operate with a blood altar, it doesn't need a blood altar in order to operate. And that's important. That's a key factor because Yahweh has again chosen Jerusalem in 1948 when the nation of Israel was born in one day. And because Yahweh has again chosen Jerusalem, we believe that's where he would want any blood sacrifices offered. Now, it's very important to understand that we're not offering blood sacrifices today. We're going to talk about that in just a slide or two. So the question, the next question then is, okay, so where do we hold the Pesach ritual? We're choosing that word very carefully. Where do we hold the Pesach ritual? So again, in Exodus chapter 12, it was held within our gates. In other words, it was performed by houses. So in the Levitical priesthood, again, it was performed at the Levitical altar because part of the purpose was to unify the nation around Yahweh's altar three times a year. At the snapshot picture of the Last Supper, at that time point, again, the offering or the lamb was offered on the Levitical altar on the conjunction of the 13th and 14th, but then Yeshua himself was offered on the tree or the cross or the stake or whatever word you want to use on the 14th. But what do we do in the Melchizedekian order? That's what we're trying to find out. That's what we want to know. Okay, this is tricky, so let's pay close attention here. I don't want to say the wrong thing. In the land of Israel, if you live in the land of Israel and you're blessed to be able to go up to Jerusalem, meaning you're not bedridden or anything like that, you should go to Jerusalem for the Pesach. It's very clear. And in the dispersion, however, with most of Ephraim and much of Judah that's sojourning with Ephraim, we, I... Our belief is that we should do it again by houses. And the reason we believe that is that the original Pesach ritual was done within our gates, in other words, on our property. 
the original Pesach ritual was done by houses. And then there's a public assembly or a public set apart gathering, a Mikra Kodesh. We'll talk about that later. And that is when we gather is on the first day of unleavened bread and also on the seventh day of unleavened bread. So on the day of the Pesach, I know everyone wants to make a big public gathering out of it, but the pattern, the original ritual, the first time we see the Pesach show up, the Pesach itself is held in the home and then Israel gathers together on the first day of unleavened bread and on the seventh day of unleavened bread. And I realize that's different than the way the rest of the world does it. That's different than the way the rabbis do it. But we're not concerned really with what the rabbis do. We're not really concerned with what anyone but Yahweh, what, what Yahweh wants us to do. Okay. Now, I want to be clear about this thing. <laughs> there are some people who like to go to the land of Israel to celebrate the Pesach. Okay. We recommend strongly against celebrating the Pesach at the coming anti-Yeshua temple. There is a third temple on the way, and it will not be a clean temple. Uh, our brothers and sisters in Orthodox Judah are getting ready to put it together right now. We can see world leaders conspiring to do this thing right now. This will not be a clean temple. It will not be a clean priesthood. It will not be a clean altar. What we need to do is we need to wait until the fourth temple, which will be Ezekiel's temple. We need to wait until that is built. And the way we will know that's Ezekiel's temple is it will be built to the specifications found in Ezekiel's chapter 40 through 46. And if anyone's interested to know more about that, I'll refer you to the study on Revelation in the end times and also the video series Revelation Simplified. Okay, people want to know, what should we do today? Should we eat standing? Well, in the original Exodus 12, Pesach, yes, we should eat standing because we're leaving Egypt. In the Levitical order, the tradition was, no, you don't need to eat standing because we're not, we're not going anywhere. The tradition is we're rehearsing dwelling in the land. Okay, at the time point of the Last Supper, Again, the tradition applied. We saw that Yeshua ate the Last Supper sitting down, similar, if not identical, to the manner of a Passover Seder, but it doesn't really matter because the Last Supper was not the Pesach. The Last Supper doesn't affect the rules of the Pesach in any way. You say, well, okay, so what are we supposed to do under the Melchizedekian order? Well, if we're in the land of Israel, yes, we should eat standing because we're going to flee the land of Israel, or Yes, we're going to flee the land of Israel when the abomination that makes desolate is set up. And if we're in the dispersion, yes, I believe we should still eat it standing, but not because we're going to flee. We're not going to go out in haste nor go by flight, says Isaiah 52 and verse 12. But we're going to leave the world system. We're going to leave the dispersion nonetheless. So it makes sense. Again, what are we trying to do? We're trying to rehearse leaving Egypt. We're trying to rehearse leaving the world system and going back home to the land of Israel. So that's how we should rehearse. Okay. And again, the difference is if we're in the land, you eat standing and in haste. If we're in the dispersion, yes, we still eat standing, but not in haste. Then the next question becomes, how should we dress? Well, under the original Exodus 12 Pesach, they ate it with their belt on their waist, their shoes on their feet, their staves in their hands, bags packed, ready to go. Because Yahweh told them, you're going to get driven out in haste. You're going to got to go all of a sudden. So be ready. Well, in the Levitical order, the tradition was that they were already free. They didn't have to go anywhere. So they ate reclining or laying down because they were rehearsing dwelling in the land. Same thing with the snapshot uh, time point of the Last Supper. The tradition, again, was to recline because they're rehearsing staying in the land and dwelling in the land. Well, they would leave Israel later, but that's a separate question. Then in the Melchizedekian order, what should we do? Well, we have our belt on our waist, our shoes on our feet, and our staff in our hands, so to speak, because we are leaving Egypt. Now, the only difference is when we're in the land, we should eat in haste because we're preparing to flee 
when the abomination that makes desolate is set up. However, in the dispersion, we're still preparing to leave Egypt. We're still preparing to leave the world and its system, but we don't flee. So therefore, we don't eat in haste. That's the only difference. Okay, so we, s- we dress the same in both circumstances, but inside the land, haste makes more sense. Do we treat it as a rehearsal for leaving Egypt? Yes. In the Levitical order, the tradition is no. And again, that was the tradition in the Last Supper because they're already in the land. Now, under the Melchizedekian order, if you live in the land, yes, you're preparing to leave Egypt because effectively, again, the, the whole world right now is under the Babylonian system and the existing land of Israel is no different. So Babylonian democracy effectively is of the world. The world equates to Egypt. Yes, we're effectively preparing and rehearsing to leave Egypt. And the same thing for in the dispersion. Is the Pesach a confirmation of the wedding covenant? Is the Pesach a confirmation of Shiduchin? Absolutely yes. And that's one of the main things we need to do in the Melchizedekian Pesach is remember our wedding vows. To remember the great sacrifice that he made and to confirm that yes, we're going to be disciples for him. Yes, we want to be his Proverbs 31 brides, doing all things that he said to do, which is to help establish his global Melchizedekian ministry. So this is our presentation on the Melchizedekian Pesach. I hope it's been helpful to you to decide what you should do under Yeshua's renewed Melchizedekian order. And I hope you're going to join us for the further modules on the wave sheaf and also upon the days of unleavened bread. Hope to see you then. Shalom. Shalom.